Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Chatting just at the moment in the form of uh, Michel Barnier and also David Davis. Let's have a quick listen. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh... And I start by welcoming Michel Barnier and his team to Downing Street, not for the first time, but uh, uh, to Downing Street, uh, to start the next round of negotiations uh, on our departure from the European Union. We have been talking, we've been having very constructive uh, conversations today, as always. Uh, the next round will focus on a number of things. For us, I guess most uh, saliently, the implementation period, uh, a period in which we will try and give clarity to both governments and business. It'll be a time-limited period, uh, and it'll lead to us being outside the customs union and, indeed, the single market uh, in the longer term. We are uh, very keen that we continue to have an extremely good and close relationship, that, we, uh, that that relationship be on economic and other grounds, and that it will continue uh, in the long term. Uh, we have to, however, in the next few months, uh, arra arrive at the uh, immediate uh, outcome, a political agreement uh, on the implementation period. Our negotiating teams are starting straight away, tomorrow certainly, uh, on an intensive period of negotiation, and we are confident that we can uh, get to that political agreement at the March Economic Council. Michel? Uh, Good afternoon to all of you, and uh, first of all, uh, David, I want to thank you for your hospitality, and I was very pleased also to, to meet the Prime Minister, Theresa May. Uh, in a very short time, from now to October, we are to advance on three fronts. First, number one, translating our joint report in a legal text. Uh, to uh, the transition period, just mentioned, uh, David. Uh, let me recall that uh, the UK government has decided uh, the date of the UK uh, withdrawal uh, on the 29th uh, of March 2019. It is its sovereign decision. Mrs. May has asked to benefit from the single market and from the customs union for a short period after this. Uh, the European Council has indicated uh, his readiness to consider this request. Uh, the conditions are clear, very clear. Everyone has to play by the same rules during this transition. Let me add uh, uh, one point about this transition, uh, the certainty about the transition will only come with the ratification of the withdrawal agreement. Uh, number three, uh, the future relationship, our future partnership between UK and EU. Uh, on that point, uh, we need also clarity about the UK proposals for the future partnership. The only thing uh, I can say, uh, without, without a customs union and uh, outside the single market, barriers to trade and goods and services are unavoidable. Uh, time uh, has come to make choice. Thank you. Question? Yeah. Well, yeah. News. Mr. Davis, we know we're leaving the customs union, but how can your government, how can your party ever agree what the alternative arrangement should be? And Mr. Barnier, on customs, do you have any idea what Britain wants and whether it's at all achievable? Let me start. It shall give you time to think. The, the first thing to say is we have already published a great deal of information about our proposals. Uh, in terms of what the customs arrangements will be, what the 
uh, other rights will be with respect to being outside the Union. We've said in terms we want a comprehensive free trade agreement and with it a customs agreement. And to make that as frictionless as possible, to make as much trade that currently exists as free as possible, while still giving ourselves the opportunity to uh, make free trade deals with the rest of the world, the fastest growing, when 90% of the rest of the growth will come, uh, uh, according to the numbers of the European Union itself. So it's perfectly clear what we want to do, uh, and there's no doubt about it, as you said yourself, we're leaving the customs union, but we're aiming for a good future for Britain. Thank you. On the same subject, huh? uh, uh, to be clear, the, the negotiations are, for the moment, only about the orderly withdrawal, and we have lots of work to do, uh, and the transition, uh, where we have also some point of discussion, negotiation, uh, and uh, perhaps a divergence. Uh, we will start the discussion about the future relationship uh, after March, and for me, the base of the guidelines of the European Council uh, in March. Uh, this also gives time to the UK to clarify its position for the future relationship. Uh, and to be frank, I will not give a running commentary on the domestic uh, and internal debate in UK. I will wait, we will wait on the European side uh, for an official UK position uh, of the government in the next few weeks. Huh? Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Wait a minute. I'm happy to keep it secret. There's no way. Bring in Faisal Islam, should we? Uh, Faisal, talking about it being constructed, these talks, everyone has to play by the same rules, but now it's the time to make the choice as far as the customs union is concerned. Yes, and David Davis there saying, well, we have made that choice and saying that they'd always made that choice. So there was some vagueness on that over the past uh, couple of weeks as various business groups pressed their case to reform a new customs union. I thought there were a couple of interesting bits there. Uh, clearly, David Davis says he's given great detail on where the UK wants to. It's perfectly clear what we want to do, says David Davis, whereas uh, Brussels says, well, no, it isn't that clear. You need to be more clear before we get a transition deal by March. Two things, though. I thought were worth picking out. Um, uh, Michel Barnier said that, uh, it, that the European Council would would look upon the idea of extending the transition uh, by a few months, I think, uh, and would look on that if requested. But I think the uh, underlying point there was that that would require uh, another decision. It could require, I think, more money, an increase in the bill. That's the suggestion I've been hearing. And there was also this sort of mere suggestion that there might be tariffs required if the UK does want to leave the customs union and the single market as it is said that would be seen as a quite some change um, uh, the prime minister has been saying that she wants the future relationship to be as tariff free as possible would that actually mean some tariffs uh, that is one reading of what michel barnier uh, just uh, suggested which would be a big shift indeed in terms of where the end state goes clearly right now in our relationship with europe there simply are no none of those barriers to trade uh, that would be, uh, you know, it wouldn't be a, across the whole piece in terms of all the uh, exports that we have, but even the mere introduction of them at all would be quite some difference. Thank you. Now let's get more on the pressure Theresa May is under to spell out in more detail what the UK wants from a post-Brexit trade deal. The EU's chief negotiator, Michel Barnier, has said the time's come for the UK to make a choice and that the country would face unavoidable trade barriers if it were to leave the single market and the customs union. Comes after Downing Street confirmed earlier today that the UK would not stay in any form of customs union after leaving the EU following pressure from pro-Brexit MPs within the Conservative Party. Joining us from Westminster is Jay McGrory, Executive Director of Open Britain, which campaigns for a close relationship with Europe after Brexit, and David Scullion, Deputy Editor of the website Brexit Central. Um, hello to you first. Let's get the Brexit Central view to start with, should we? Um, it's very complicated, and yet it's very simple. Britain is saying, uh, this is what we want. The European Union saying, tough. Where's that leading us? 
Well, this is the EU just starting negotiating, and that's fantastic. They're negotiating on this, they're opening stances, it's going to be really difficult, and we need to negotiate back. Look, the Prime Minister has said this week that we're not going to be in the customs union, we're not going to be in a customs union, and that's great news, and we're waiting later in the week for the Brexit war cabinet to finally decide. Are we going to decide to have this kind of uh, aligned view with the EU? Are we going to stay in the customs union and not be able to strike our own free trade agreements? Or are we going to break free and be able to reduce costs on food, clothing and footwear? and things like that. James? Well, I think the government's very good at telling us what they don't want, and overnight you've seen new briefings to that effect on the customs union and a customs union, but they're not very good at telling us what they do want. It's 19 months after the referendum, and the Cabinet haven't even yet discussed amongst themselves, let alone agreed, what we want our future relationship to be with our, comfortably, our largest trading partner. And Michel Barnier, the EU's chief negotiator, is over in London today. He's met with David Davis, and he stated the very, very simple fact. If you come outside of a customs union with the European Union, you're going to erect barriers to trade. There will be very real costs, costs to our economy, costs in terms of jobs, and the government's going to have to start being upfront with people about it, what it really means. David, um, we want barrier-free trade. Uh, the Europeans are saying you've got no chance. I think James is uh, mistaking an opening negotiating pitch for the final deal. You know, uh, this is what they started with. And, and, you know, we start from a period of total alignment. We start from a period of no tariffs with the EU. We're not going to be the ones erecting them. But if they do erect them, you know, they sell more to us than we sell to them. And being outside of the customs union means we can reduce tariffs on things that we don't create ourselves. You know, the kind of 11% tariff we have on footwear, you know, footwear, food and clothing, which cost the poorest people in our society the most money. We can reduce those tariffs and we can lower prices for people here in Britain. James, there you go. Well, it's a lovely uh, rose-tinted view of the world, but I'm afraid it has no basis in the hard, cold ne negotiating realities of top-table trade negotiations. Um, if we do what David's suggesting, as the economist that Brexit Central, his organisation, always loved to cite, Patrick, Patrick Minford, it's his line that, that David's uh, parroting today, he has said that that solution will eliminate British manufacturing. That's not, that's not my words, that's Patrick Minford's words. That will eliminate British manufacturing. That's millions of jobs in this country. So I think it would be a catastrophically bad idea. And David also says that this is an, an opening negotiating gambit. Well, it's not even that from Britain, isn't it? We have not put across the, to the other side of the negotiating table what we actually want. And it's high time the government started coming clean with people. We cannot have our cake and eat it. We cannot have the exact same benefits outside of the single market that we enjoy inside of it. And we cannot have completely frictionless trade outside of the customs union as we enjoy inside it. I'm surprised we have to state that. But it's about time, David, and the government started being honest with people. There are trade-offs here. If you want to do other things by leaving the customs union, that's fine. But stop trying to pull the wool over people's eyes and suggest there aren't real costs to this in terms of people's jobs and their livelihoods. Absolutely not, no. What I think is really, really surprising is that James McGorry thinks that Project Fear is going to work again a second time. Look, they, they poured £9 million into a leaflet saying that there was going to be Armageddon if we voted to leave. We're supposed to be in dire recession right now. But what have we seen? We've seen record foreign direct investment into this country. Uh, manufacturing is at something like a 20-year high and business confidence is growing. Look, it didn't work that time and it's not going to work this time. 90% of world growth is outside the failing EU. Well, look, the facts of the matter are this. Before the referendum, we were the fastest growing economy in the G7. Now we're the slowest. Anybody who's been on holiday in the last couple of years to the continent can tell you that the pound has taken an absolute beating. Inflation is outstripping people's wages, so real wages are falling. The Governor of the Bank of England last week, or a couple of weeks ago, estimated that Brexit is already costing the British economy £200 million a week. And that's before we've left. And the idea that we're suddenly going to make everything better for our economy by eliminating British manufacturing, I think, is a very, very dangerous path to go down indeed. I'm not worried of retaking our seats on the World Trade Organization. I'm not worried about striking free trade agreements with the rest of the world, with Asia, which is absolutely booming. Like, I don't know why James is, is holding fast to project fear where we have to stay closely aligned with the EU because Britain can't make it on its own in the world. Look, the British people rejected that negative vision and they embraced the positive vision of vote leave which said, look, Britain's a sovereign nation. We can make our own decisions. We can, we can make, set our own tariff limits and we can take our seat on the World Trade Organization. 
as you're doing now, all Vote Leave told people was that we could have our cake and eat it. And as everyone knows, you can't have your cake and eat it. You've got to either have your cake or you can eat it. And now is the time for government to eat it and be, start being honest with people about what that means. On one breath, the Prime Minister was in China last week, patting herself on the back about how we'd managed to do £9 billion worth of new trade deals with China. Now, that sounds all pretty good to me, but we're inside the single market and the customs union. And then in the very next breath, they say, oh, to do more trade with China, we've got to leave the single market and the customs union. It doesn't really make any sense at all. They are selling people a vision that simply doesn't exist. If you want to do new trade deals with China and America and India that aren't coming anytime soon, Liam Fox himself said that last week, and he's the Trade Secretary, then there's going to be a very, very, very real hit to GDP from leaving the customs union and the single market, bearing in mind that the EU is the, the group of people with whom we do half of all our trade. David, TikTok. <laughs> well, look, we can already do things without striking free trade agreements outside of the EU. We can reduce tariffs, as I said, on food, clothing and footwear, which would immediately lower prices in Britain. Look, why on earth do we have a, a tariff on coffee when we don't grow it ourselves? Why can't we make that cheaper immediately? The European Union is saying that we can't do any sort of uh, deals until after we come out of the European Union in 2020. Are they wrong? They are absolutely wrong. <laughs> we, we, can, we can do deals. Legally, we can do deals during the transition period. We can do them and we can sign them after that ends. Um, OK, final thought from you, James? Well, look, I think on, on trade deals, there's quite an interesting thing that's often glossed over by, by David and other Brexit extremists on his side of the argument. And that's that the EU has in place uh, trade deals with 65 countries around the world and some pretty significant growing economies, the likes of South Korea, Canada, Mexico, people with whom we do a decent amount of trade, nothing compared to the European B Union, but then no country is. Um, now, what's going to happen to those trade deals? I think everyone would like to see them rolled over, but those countries have been queuing up to say that's far from guaranteed. So to get David's vision of, you know, free trade promises uh, at some time in the future is all very well and good, but we're not only going to lose uh, membership of the single market and the customs union and reduce trade with our largest trading partner, we're going to lose 65 trade deals with other countries around the world. On top of that, I'd suggest the government need to pull their finger out. Guys, we're out of time. Good to talk to you. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. The Prime Minister has been warned that her decision to leave the EU's customs union, which allows goods to move between EU countries without tariffs, will cause unavoidable barriers to trade. And the European Union's chief Brexit negotiator, Michel Barnier, who was in Downing Street for talks today, said the time had come for Britain to make a choice on what it wants for its future. But the Brexit Secretary, David Davis, said being outside the customs union would allow the United Kingdom to strike new trade deals with the rest of the world. Here's our political editor, Laura Koonsberg. In a hurry. Not just to catch the 10.56 from Brussels to London. We have not a minute to lose huh? because we want to, to achieve a deal. But the EU's chief negotiator wants to press on. It's time for bargaining, he says, as the next round of Brexit talks loom. The first priority for him and his host, David Davis, is to agree what happens straight after Brexit. Do you know what the British government wants, Mr Barnier? The two years or so time frame, when not that much will change. But the real posturing is about the longer term. Theresa May popped in for a drink. After reminding her party she wants out of the single market free trade area and the current customs union. But she knows, along with these two, there might be mishaps along the way. Our negotiating teams are starting straight away, tomorrow certainly, uh, on an intensive period of negotiation and we are confident that we can uh, get to that political agreement. Yet while this might sound say. elegant in a French accent, it's still a Without. warning. Without the customs union and uh, outside the single market, barriers to trade and goods and services are unavoidable. Uh, time uh, has come to make choice. In other words, Foreign Secretary and others, make your minds up. The EU's consistently said we can't keep the best bits of the EU without losing somewhere. But that's always been rejected by Brexiteers. What my side wants, now the most of the country wants, is a good deal. And the way to get a good deal is to be very clear that we are leaving, and we're leaving the single market, we're leaving the customs union. 
The fear of others in the Tory party and in Parliament is that the Eurosceptics are too close to number 10. This week, the Prime Minister hopes to get the Cabinet to find a compromise. What is more important, sticking close to the EU or making the most of freedom outside? We've heard a lot of, we're not going to do this and we're not going to do that. What are we going to do? That is what we're waiting to hear. That's what the 27 countries the UK is negotiating with are waiting to hear. And in the meantime, this uncertainty is really, really bad for business. Number 10 has to make bargains inside its party, as well as with the EU outside. Today's talks were about the EU and the UK plugging back in before the next charge round of negotiations really get going. But arguably, for there to be meaningful progress anytime soon, UK ministers have to speed up their decisions about their overall approach. None of the questions are easy, but after months of squabbling, time to discuss becomes time to decide. Laura Kunzberg, BBC News, Westminster. So what will be the impact of leaving the customs union and how will trade between the UK and the European Union be affected? Our economics editor Kamal Ahmed is here. Thanks very much, Sophie. Well, first thing, trade really matters to the UK economy and our jobs. We export 28% of everything we make. Our biggest customer is the EU. 43% of all UK exports go there. And to help that trade, we are a member of what is called the Customs Union. That means that goods and services can circulate freely throughout the EU with no import taxes and few border checks. UK firms were able to integrate themselves into cross-European supply chain networks, okay, so that firms can have their manufacturing networks extend across, across countries. The second main benefit is that large multinational companies located their investment and jobs in the UK in the first place in order to take advantage of not just the UK market but also the European market. The third benefit is that as a part of the large EU trading bloc, the UK was able to extract concessions in negotiating agreements with other countries like China that they might not have been able to extract if they were just operating individually. Now, the government has made it clear it wants to leave the customs union so that we are less constrained by EU trade rules. But, as Michel Barnier has made very clear today, that means taxes and border checks are likely for our exports to the EU, like food and cars. And that's a barrier to trade. And we could respond by applying our own taxes to imports from the EU, which could increase prices. The PM insists she wants a good trade deal with the EU. She calls it frictionless trade. And for businesses like this steel firm in Northern Ireland, having no border checks really matters. For anyone to remember back to the days uh, when they did have a, a, a stop at the border and we did have customs clearance processes, very, very disruptive. Um, and doesn't, not constructive or helpful to business or trading between the two countries. The British government says it wants to throw its trade arms wide and do free trade deals with countries like America and China, prevented at present because we are members of that customs union. The question is, how quickly can we do those deals? And will they replace the close trading relationship we presently have with our most important export customer? Now, the EU's chief Brexit negotiator says it is unavoidable that Britain will face trade barriers if we leave the customs union. During a visit to Downing Street, Michel Barnier said the government must now make a choice. It puts more pressure on the Prime Minister to spell out what kind of deal she actually wants, as our political correspondent Paul Brand reports. They may have walked side by side today, but you couldn't miss the distance between them. Any chance of close alignment in these talks? The EU's chief negotiator arrived in Downing Street this afternoon, its British host pointing out a few landmarks, but it's clear the EU wants far more direction than that. After lunch and a chat with the Prime Minister, Michel Barnier warned it's time Britain made its mind up about our future trade with the EU and how much we're willing to disrupt it. Without a customs union and uh, outside the single market, barriers to trade and goods and services are unavoidable. Uh, time uh, has come to make choice. 
And last night, the government did, to a degree, saying we won't be in any kind of customs union with the EU, where goods can be traded without taxes, but Britain can't do deals with other countries. But not everyone likes the alternatives. A customs partnership, where we align our rules with the EU, but still have the freedom to strike other trade deals, or a streamlined customs arrangement, where we have separate rules, but use technology to speed up checks at the border. We know we're leaving the customs union, but how can your government, how can your party ever agree what the alternative arrangement should be? We've said in terms we want a comprehensive free trade agreement and with it a customs agreement. And to make that as frictionless as possible. It's perfectly clear what we want to do uh, and there's no doubt about it, as you said yourself, we're leaving the customs union, but we're aiming for a good future for Britain. You won. But as ever, Brexit's causing a row, not least with the majority of MPs who want to stay in some kind of customs union, including this Conservative, who told ITV News they could block the deal. Look, who's running our country? It is not 30, 35 hard, ideologically driven Brexiteers who unfortunately are in my party. That's not how we deliver Brexit. That's not what people voted for. It should be just a, a light walk. Leaving the customs union breaks businesses into a sweat too. This one's worried tariffs could increase the cost of its sports gear. The margins are already stretched in what we do. There's not massive margins and it's only going to eat into the margins that are there, making uh, profits harder to come by. Michel Barnier may have left tonight, but negotiations continue, both with the EU and with everyone who has a view on it. And the really tough negotiations come on Wednesday and Thursday when several members of the Cabinet have got to try and agree a position on trade. Downing Street's tried to appease Brexiteers today, but only by enraging Remainers. This week's talks with the EU are actually supposed to be about our transition out of the EU. But as ever, the sticking point to be, seems to be where on earth we're headed to. OK, Paul Brand and Westminster, thank you. It's make your mind up time on Brexit, the EU's chief negotiator has told Theresa May. Michel Barnier was in Downing Street for lunch with the Brexit secretary and the prime minister dropped in to meet him as well. Speaking afterwards, Mr Barnier warned Britain would face unavoidable barriers if it leaves the customs union and the single market. After a weekend of confusion on the government's post-Brexit customs policy, David Davis insisted it was perfectly clear that Britain was leaving the customs union and wanted a free trade and customs agreement instead. Our political editor, Gary Gibbon, reports. After days of scrapping here over where Brexit policy is going, the EU chief negotiator came to find out for himself what the government's up to. He asked what the grand building on the other side of the road was. It's the Foreign Office, David Davis said. Mr Barnier gazed up at Boris Johnson's lair before going in for talks. He then delivered this blunt message for Tories desperate to leave the customs union. We need also clarity about the UK proposals for the future partnership. The only thing uh, I can say, uh, without, without a customs union and uh, outside the single market, barriers to trade and goods and services are unavoidable. Uh, time uh, has come to make choice. Thank you. Michel Barnier's message, it's make your mind up time. His team in Brussels have been told to expect British officials to tell them on Friday what the British government's position is on a future relationship. But ministers here who are expected to decide in meetings on Wednesday and Thursday what that position is say they haven't seen the Prime Minister's compromise proposal yet. The two chief negotiators were asked, were they clear on Britain's position? And gave very different answers. Mr Barnier, on customs, do you have any idea what Britain wants and whether it's at all achievable? Let me start. It shall give you time to think. The, the first thing to say is we have already published a great deal of information about our proposals. Uh, in terms of what the customs arrangements will be, what the uh, other arrangements will be with respect to being outside the union. We've said in terms we want a comprehensive free trade agreement and with it a customs agreement. And to make that as frictionless as possible. To be frank, I will not give a running commentary on the domestic uh, and internal debate in UK. I will wait, we will wait on the European side uh, for an official UK position uh, of the government in the next few weeks. Huh? 
at the heart of government indecision. Does Britain stay in the customs union, or something a lot like it, or quit altogether? Being in the EU customs union means goods move tariff-free and without border checks within the EU. But all members agree to slap the same tariffs on other countries, so the UK wouldn't be able to be in the customs union and strike its own trade deals. Brexit supporters, though, want Britain to negotiate its own trade agreements. So the government's floated two approaches. A high-tech solution that means vehicles aren't stopped at the border, or an arrangement that means the UK collects tariffs for goods bound for the EU. One Brussels source said the technology to support the first proposal simply hadn't been invented yet, and the second proposal, they said, was plain silly. It looks as though even if ministers did manage to agree a common approach on customs, it could be quickly dismissed by Brussels. I think it's very likely that um, Britain will remain in the customs union for, for longer than the two years of the transition which everybody is talking about, simply because we don't have a solution yet um, that will work and that the EU would agree. Um, and it's going to take time uh, to put in place any kind of solution um, after some sort of agreement about what kind of trading relationship the UK will have with the EU is struck. The Prime Minister joined the talks for a while. Her search continues for a plan she can take to him. But she leads a party where many want to leave the customs union in a parliament which, put to the test, might just vote the other way. Well, joining me now is the Tory MP Peter Bowen, a leading Brexiteer, and from Westminster, Baroness Ros Altman, a former Conservative Pensions Minister. Peter Bowen, what is the difference between a customs union and a customs arrangement? Well, good evening. 417 days and we're out of this dreadful uh, European Union superstate, whether there's a customs union or not. The point is, if you're in the customs union, you cannot do free trade deals with other countries. 90% of the growth in world trade will come outside the EU. That's why we must be free to do that. That's why we can't be in the customs union. But you think you can have your cake and eat it? You can have free trade with Europe and free trade with countries outside Europe, and Europe won't mind? Well, if you're um, the managing director of Mercedes-Benz, I think you really want to do a free trade deal with the United Kingdom. The European Union sells us £80 billion more of goods than we sell to them. So it's much more in their interest that they do a free trade deal than in ours. So I think the economic pressures on the European Union will mount from within their own countries. Uh, Ros Altman, why is this nonsense? Honestly, I cannot believe what I'm hearing. The EU has made its position clear. We are still hoping for some kind of magical nirvana it doesn't exist. If we want to sustain the industrial success that we've built up over the last 40 years, then coming out of the customs union, uh, and possibly the single market, but certainly the customs union, is simply madness. We have integrated supply chains which depend upon being part of the EU customs union. We can't make the Northern Ireland border without being properly integrated within the EU. Indeed, we promised in December that we would have full regulatory alignment because there's nothing else that works to keep the Good Friday Agreement and protect the peace that we have in Northern Ireland. Do you think the trouble is that, as BuzzFeed revealed at the end of January, a lot of MPs just don't understand any of this? I think that's, that's clearly the case. You know, at the moment we have free trade with our most important trading partners. We have tr free trade agreements with lots of other countries outside the EU as a result of being a member of the EU and all the money and time that we have spent within the EU to build up really good trading arrangements. I don't know a single country <coughs> that would give us a better deal than we currently have within the EU once we're outside it. Do you? No, I, mean, I just think that's total nonsense. I mean, when I was in business, if somebody wanted to buy my product, uh, they'd buy it. It didn't matter whether there was a customs border there or not. No, no, no. In answer to Ros Altman's question, do you know a country that would give you a better deal outside the customs union? Well, the whole thing is we can negotiate a free trade agreement with anyone in the world. Once Who do you have in mind? Well, we're talking to already talking to the United States. The biggest country, of course, that we do business with is the USA. And uh, the President Trump has rather keen on improving that. So you think, what, we'll be able to buy cheaper goods from America 
into Britain, and then what will happen to those goods if people in Britain try to sell them into Europe? Well, if we... Because that's what Europe will worry it, about, it, Well, let's see what they do, because this is all about the negotiation, but I'm going to go back to what I said but at the beginning. Would, no, no, there, no, there, no, there would be barriers, wouldn't there? No, that's no, the point. Well, the point is, would there be? Because they sell £80 billion more to us than we to them, so why would it be in their interest to stop that trading? It would penalise them for Ros more than Ros us. Altman, why, why would they stop us? They want us to continue being partners, but if we are saying to them, I'm sorry, we are not going to play by your rules, and the partnership depends on a level playing field, then they simply cannot give us what we seem to have promised the British people. So what would happen? What would actually happen? We would see the erection of new customs checks? Yes, there would be border queues, there would be, you know, trails of lorries going back. The border in Northern Ireland would not be protected. I think there are some people in the Tory party who genuinely think this is a game of bluff and we can carry on asking for the impossible and somehow magically it will appear. It will not appear. We've got to Peter get Mo, real. You think the bluff will work, don't you? Because uh, well, they, they I, I need think, to sell I think BMWs I think to Britain I think and Prosecco. Everyone's interest. That's basically but your if, argument. if there was no deal, there'd be no requirement on us to put tariffs on. There'd be no requirement for us to do border checks. There'd be no requirement for us to have a border in Northern Ireland. It'd be up to what the European Union wants to do in their countries. That's fine. But there's no requirement for us to do any of those things. So, we, so they could have a border, but we wouldn't? If they wanted to put borders... And how would that work? Well, that's entirely... Nonsense. Do you really think the Irish government would want to set up a border? Of course they wouldn't. I mean, that's just not going to happen. Ros Altman? That they are part of the European Union. They cannot just unilaterally say, oh, well, actually, we won't bother with a border. That is not how the world works. We've got to get real. We're misleading the British people. Our party is split, and there are 30, <laughs> 40, 50 people who have a very... A poor grasp of how the real world works. Moderate Tories, such as myself, are distraught at what we're seeing. We're becoming an international laughing stock. We cannot continue like this. Uh, Ros Altman and Peter Bone, thank you both very much. Kathy. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Suddenly, everyone stopped mincing their words. As the government clarified there'd be no customs union post-Brexit, Michel Barnier, the chief EU negotiator, arriving in Downing Street, said that would cause unavoidable barriers to trade. He called on the UK to explain what it was looking for in terms of future relations with the EU and insisted that the time has now come to make a choice. So those who favour a short, sharp break now hanging out the bunting. As for the rest, call them Remainers or soft Brexiteers or what you will, are they feeling the cloud of something long feared becoming a stark reality? Our political editor, Nick Watt, is here and... Uh, been hearing strong stuff from one of the Conservative Party's most ardent Remainers tonight. Nick, just tell us what you heard. That's right. I mean, Anna Soubry has been pretty outspoken since that Brexit referendum, but there you were seeing at the top of the programme, she's saying that uh, her party appears to be in hock to what she describes as 35 ideological hard Brexiteers, and it's time that Theresa May stood up to them and slung them out. Mm. And if this doesn't happen, then Anna Soubry, who sat in David Cameron's cabinet as a business minister, says, if it comes to it, I'm not going to stay in a party which has been taken over by the likes of Jacob Rees-Mogg and Boris Johnson. And she says, we simply cannot go on like this any longer. Something is going to have to give, because if it doesn't, not only will we get Jacob Rees-Mogg as our Prime Minister, we will get a devastatingly hard Brexit, she says. Now, Anna Soubry has said stuff in this sort of territory in recent months, but she hasn't gone quite this far. It's also important to say that Anna Soubry can at times go a little further than some of her Remain Tory colleagues, but I am picking up quite a lot of frustration amongst those MPs. So, look, today I've been looking at the pressures on Theresa May as she looks to settling what the UK wants for its future relationship with the EU. I'm not afraid. I'll race you and I'll win. Politics is, in many ways, about the art of timing. Winning can demand speed, but sometimes patience is the virtue that will ultimately take you over the finishing line in first place. Look at that white tail flash. And so it is proving with Brexit, 
there have been unmistakable signs of anguish amongst some Leave supporters who fear that as time marches on, their dreams of a clean Brexit are slipping away. And then there are Remainers who appear to be biding their time for a more complex exit from the EU. The fears and frustrations over the nature of the UK's departure from the EU have come to a head on above all one issue. What sort of customs relationship will the UK have with the EU? Some Brexit supporters fear the Treasury is nudging Theresa May towards a version of the current customs union, which would make it all but impossible for the UK to negotiate free trade deals around the world. Their nerves were calmed somewhat this morning when Downing Street ruled out this option. The EU's chief negotiator, Michel Barnier, was in Downing Street today, where he warned that leaving the customs union and single market would create unavoidable barriers to trade. Downing Street said this morning that the UK would not be staying in the customs union or a watered-down version dubbed a customs union. The government is looking at two options. A customs arrangement in which new technology would be harnessed to create as frictionless a border as possible between the UK and the EU a customs partnership in which the UK and the EU would set their own tariffs, but they would create as frictionless a border as possible by levying each other's tariffs on goods transiting their borders. I understand Theresa May is still keen on this option. But there is a third option that could be pushed by Remain supporters who point out that the EU has talked of magical thinking in Whitehall. This is the possibility of a vote in Parliament later this year to maintain a version of the current customs union. One Remain supporter warns of serious consequences if Theresa May refuses to keep her options open. Labour's front bench itself is ideological. My front bench probably isn't, but it's in hock to 35 hard ideological Brexiteers who are not Tories. They're not the Tory party that I joined 40 years ago. And it's about time Theresa stood up to them and slung them out because they've taken down Major, they took down Cameron, two great leaders, neither of whom stood up to them. Well, if it comes to it, I'm not going to stay in a party which has been taken over by the likes of Jacob Rees-Mogg and Boris Johnson. They're not proper Conservatives. And if that means leaving the party, form some new alliance, God knows, I don't know, but we just simply cannot go on like this any longer. Something is going to have to give, because if it doesn't, not only will we get Jacob Rees-Mogg as our Prime Minister, we'll get a devastating hard Brexit, which will cause huge damage to our economy for generations to come, and I'm not prepared to sit by any longer and put up with this nonsense. One Brexiteer insists there is strong unity in the party. I found a very strong unity of purpose which is everybody agrees that the British people said we needed to leave the EU. In order to do that we need to leave the single market, the customs union and regain control of our laws and our borders and it is the politicians who will determine how we set policy and the civil servants who will help implement it. And where civil servants have tended to speak out perhaps more than is usual I think Jacob feels that they have crossed a line uh, which is inappropriate. Our political class is working on one iconic clock, as that now silent landmark ticks down to the Brexit deadline, the two sides know that whoever masters the timing may master the result. Nick Watt there will join me from Strasbourg as Mairead McGuinness, Vice President of the European Parliament, and Lord Lamont, the former Chancellor of the Exchequer and supporter of Leave Means Leave. And I'll come to you, Lord Lamont, in a second. But if I can just turn to uh, Mairead McGuinness, uh, do you feel it's all become much simpler now? Do you understand better the UK government's position as of today? Not particularly. Um, I think I understand what the UK doesn't want to be part of because very clearly the red lines are the customs union and single market. I regret that, but I, I hear those are the red lines. But I'm not sure exactly what the United Kingdom wants in terms of the future partnership. I know these two options were published last August in a position paper, but the option that the Prime Minister appears to be backing from your report is unprecedented and there's been no work done to flesh that out. So um, at this remove, what 
we're watching is uh, literally a, a battle within the Conservative Party about what it wants for Brexit. And in the meantime, we here at the European Union level are trying to make sure that we do reach some agreement with the United Kingdom because we want to have a relationship post-Brexit. But we also have to f finalize the details of the withdrawal agreement and agree a transition period. So it's does, going to be quite a busy yeah. time. And this week is certainly an interesting week in those developments. Marie McGuinness, does it matter if it's unprecedented? I mean, all this is unprecedented. So, for example, when Michel Barnier comes to London and says tariffs are unavoidable, they're not. I mean, he's trying to, everyone's trying to call everyone's bluff. They're not unavoidable. No, I don't think this is at all a game of bluff because uh, in my office, for example, uh, practically every day there are representatives of British industry, whether it's the pharmaceutical sector or others coming, trying to get me to understand their position and I understand it completely because they have fears about moving away from the European regulatory framework, for example, when it comes to public health and access to pharmaceuticals. So let's stop calling this a game of bluff or political ga um, games. Well, it's right. not. This is about people's lives and livelihoods. Well, let me and ask that's you Politically, while this is difficult, Michel, may, may I just finish? But Michel Barnier needs to spell out how things are. If the United Kingdom leaves the customs union and single market, and we don't know what is going to be in its place, and I think he is right to do that, and I think that uh, David Davis understands that, and I hope the okay. Prime Minister understands it. What you, I hope will happen this week is that the officials yeah. and others will come, come to a better idea of, of what the UK wants. You will understand better than most sure. the huge. Uh, question over the Irish border. Now, do you really think at this point that the EU Parliament Indeed. will pass any deal that creates a border within Ireland? Well, I think the question is the other way around, if I may say, because it's the one piece of text I keep very close to my heart, and it is about this agreement which the United Kingdom has made. It's paragraph 49 of the text. And I think it's really important that the United Kingdom has given a clear commitment that there will be no return to a hard border on the island of Ireland. And it wants to do that in terms of future arrangements. It needs to be compatible. It also wants, if that doesn't happen, it's admitting and saying that we will have specific solutions of to the course, border. But, but you and have that to, if you all there'll be full border. alignment. So, but, but with respect to your position, I represent a border community uh, on the island of Ireland. We know what we have today and that's what we value. And we very much appreciate the United Kingdom's commitment in the withdrawal agreement that there will be no hard border. And we will appreciate the United Kingdom coming to the table and negotiating with the European Union so that there is no hard border. So look, this is um, a part of the process. You know how difficult the withdrawal agreement was? It was the last minutes when it was finally sure. agreed on money, on borders and citizens' rights. I hope it's not the same with this future partnership because we need it for security of business and others that we get some sort of framework in place so that business can understand what lies ahead. Sure. Mairead McGuinness, thank you very much indeed. Lord Lamont, if I come to you. Firstly, those comments then from Anna Soubry, who's called on the Prime Minister to show some spine and sling out the hardline Brexiteers, she names Boris Johnson, Jacob Rees-Mogg in particular. She points to 35 others. Uh, I think that's quite ridiculous, frankly. Uh, I don't want to be rude about Anna Subri, but I think she does tend sometimes to go over the top, and I think she's doing that here. There are, obviously, while the government is in the process of formulating its approach, different voices from different parts of the party. But she's not wrong, but... is she, when she says that, actually, Europe and the divisions brought down Major, brought down Cameron, uh, and May has going to be the third, if you like, victim or the third one in those circumstances, unless she stands up to But people. I don't think the, the hardline Brexiteers, as you call them, are aiming to bring the Prime Minister down. Far from it. They are trying to influence her in one direction. And now, do you think they do have that influence now? Do you yeah, think they, they are now in control from what you've no, heard today of the they're Customs not, Union? they're not in control. And the two things that Anna Subri was objecting to, one, leaving the Customs Union, and two, leaving the single market, Theresa May has decided to pursue that for two very simple reasons. The first with the customs union is to have the freedom to strike trade deals elsewhere in the world and leaving the single market is essential because she judges, and I think she feels this quite strongly, that the British public also were determined that we should have greater control over our borders. She says... And you can't do that 
unless you leave the single market. L let me so just those wanna... are the two reasons. It's not to do with any faction in the Conservative Party. OK, she hears it differently, obviously. She t calls them ideological Brexiteers <laughs> who are not Tories. Let me just run this past you. Something is going to give, because if it doesn't, she means if Theresa May doesn't stand up and show, as she says, some spine, not only will we get Jacob Rees-Mogg as our Prime Minister, we'll get a devastating hard Brexit which will cause huge damage to our economy. Would you welcome Jacob Rees-Mogg in the position of Look, Prime when, Minister? Look, when she says a devastatingly hard Brexit, she is objecting to the two things the Prime Minister has decided, leaving the single market and leaving... Uh, the customs union. I've explained that's been done for very logical reasons. It's not been done because Jacob Rees-Mogg or anyone else asked for it. Other people have asked for but it. But in the voice but... of Mairead McGuinness, <coughs> who you just heard there, saying, not only is it unprecedented, this is not a game of bluff, there are businesses and people and lives who will be affected because there is no deal possible without tariffs that cost money. Yes, but as you yourself uh, pointed out, if there is a free trade agreement, uh, Tariffs will... Why would be, they? Why well, would be, they? Be, the, the, there has to be a free trade agement because it's overwhelmingly in the European Union's interest. I make the assumption that the European Union is rational and will look after its own interest. But we keep on telling ourselves, don't we, that it is in Europe's interest to come to the table, to give us the deal we want. Europe has made very little of the running so far and we know that Europe will probably survive with its other 26 members look, without the UK. Look, we're, we're sitting in the UK, quite understandably, the way you look at it is you say, here's what the EU wants, that's never going to change, and that's absolutely adamantine, and here's what Britain wants, that's unattainable. That's how the domestic press look at it, but that's not the reality. If you remember what was said before the financial settlement was agreed, oh, 100 billion. That will never, ever come down. In the end, the EU changed its position and Theresa May got what she wanted. And I think that will happen again. Lord Lamont, thank you very much. Thanks for coming in.